I'm going to spend some time in this segment talking about shunts, specifically pulmonary shunts. A shunt is a bypass circuit. In this example, we're looking at a left-to-right shunt. Here's the left heart, the right heart. Blood normally flows from the aorta through the arteries to the tissues, back to the right heart, and back to the lung. In this example, some of the blood is moving directly over to the right heart and then passing through the lung. This means that some of the oxygenated blood is going to go back and pick up oxygen again. This is not a serious problem, although it does mean that there is some blood flow that is not getting to the tissues. An example of a left to right shunt might be a patent ductus arteriosus. Now, the pulmonary shunt, on the other hand, is called right to left shunt. A right to left shunt occurs when you have blood leaving the right heart, heading to the lung, not picking up gas, and then coming back to the left heart. This shunt can occur in the pulmonary veins. For example, if an alveolus is collapsed, if an alveolus is filled with water, in the case of pulmonary edema, then blood that passes that alveolus is not going to pick up any oxygen. It's going to end up back in the pulmonary vein or in the left heart. This is going to lead to a poor oxygenation of the blood heading to the tissues. I've colored it here kind of a magenta, a purple color, to indicate that there's some degree of deoxygenated blood mixing with the oxygenated blood. And that leaves the PO2 entering the tissues low. One example of a normal shunt occurs in the bronchial circulation. In this example, I'm looking at bronchial artery, feeding bronchial tissue, not the alveoli, feeding bronchial tissue. That would be the smooth muscle, the epithelial cells lining the airways. This tissue will consume oxygen, produce CO2, much of it will head back to the bronchial vein, and some of it, however, will enter the pulmonary vein, which has just returned from the alveoli and will be oxygen-rich coming in, and somewhat poorer heading out and back to the left atrium. This may account for 1 or 2 percent of the total blood. Approximately 1 or 2 percent of the blood entering the left heart has been shunted. Another normal source of shunting occurs in the heart itself called the Thebasian veins. The Thebasian circulation takes blood from the left ventricle and much of it heads over and is dumped into the right heart. From the right ventricle is dumped into the right heart. But a small amount of it comes from the left ventricle and is dumped back into the left heart. This small amount of blood then produces a lower PO2 than one might normally see. And this could be another 1% shunt. So in general, you're talking about 2-4% to 4 shunted blood in normal individuals, assuming the alveolar PO2 was 100, and therefore the, the pulmonary capillary blood would reach equilibrium and be 100, but the arterial blood might be down around 95 rather than 100. That out. And I'm going to talk just a, briefly about the determination of shunt fraction. The shunt fraction indicated here as Q dot S over Q dot T. The dot indicates a rate. Whenever you see Q dot or V dot, it means rate. So the flow of shunted blood divided by the flow total is the shunt fraction. The point I want to make here is that it depends on the content of oxygen. It has nothing to do with the partial pressure of oxygen. So this capital C here is the content of pulmonary capillary, small c, oxygen, minus the content of arterial oxygen divided by the content of capillary oxygen minus the content of venous oxygen. And I've given an example here. I'll let you work that out. And let's assume that the arterial oxygen was exactly the same as the pulmonary capillary blood equilibrated with alveolar air. The difference between the two would be zero, and therefore there would be no shunt fraction. If, on the other hand, the content of arterial oxygen was the same as the content of venous oxygen, then CCO2 minus CaO2 divided by CCO2 minus CVO2 would in fact be one, and that means 100% of the blood had been shunted. Anything in between there can be calculated using these contents. There's a simple, clinically useful way to estimate the shunt fraction. 
we give a patient 100% oxygen to breathe, call that FiO2, the fractional concentration of inspired oxygen, equals 100%. We then measure arterial PO2. There is approximately a 1% shunt for every 20 millimeter of oxygen difference between arterial and alveolar PO2. So let's take a quick look at what that means. At sea level, the barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Water vapor pressure at any altitude is always 47 millimeters of mercury when body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So we have to subtract 47 millimeters of mercury from our total pressure. And there's approximately 40 millimeters of mercury of CO2 in the alveoli. That leaves us with 673 millimeters of mercury when breathing 100% oxygen. Not 760 millimeters of mercury, 673 millimeters of mercury. If we measure arterial PO2 at 470 millimeters of mercury, that's 200 millimeters of mercury difference. And if 20 millimeters of mercury difference was a 1% shunt, then 200 millimeters of mercury difference is a 10% shunt. We can make an approximate estimate of the shunt fraction in individuals following breathing 100% and equilibrating with 100% oxygen. Now I'm going to open up my computer model to look at the shunt. This will be a right to left shunt deoxygenated blood moving over to the oxygenated side, pulmonary shunt. And we'll be looking at different aspects of the shunt and its effect on arterial blood and venous blood gases. With this computer simulation, I can do several things. I can change alveolar PO2. It's at about 100, normal alveolar PO2 at sea level. I can bring the individual up to altitude, say an alveolar PO2 of about 60, and we can change the shunt fraction here between 0 and 50 percent. I can change hemoglobin concentration. I can change metabolic rate. I can change cardiac output, pH, and hemoglobin affinity. I can also increase the chart length to see PO2s higher than 120 millimeters of mercury. All right, I've just reinitialized, put everything back to normal. And what we're going to do now is to look at the effect of shunt fraction on arterial and venous PO2. Arterial PO2 is shown here in green, and we see it down here in this box, also colored green. Venous PO2 is shown here in blue, and we can see the numbers down here in this box, colored blue. And our alveolar PO2 is in yellow, which equilibrates with the capillaries, the pulmonary capillaries in the lung. So end capillary PO2 is 100, arterial PO2 is 92, venous PO2 is 41. So let's increase the shunt fraction. It's now at about 2% shunt. Here we're up to 10% shunt, and we can see a large PO2 difference, 100 to about 75. There's a 25 millimeter mercury PO2. But we're still 97% saturated. We still have about 20 volumes percent of oxygen content. That's 20 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood in the ideal capillaries we see 20.6 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood. Let's bring it up to 20% shunt. Now we're beginning to see a significant drop in PO2. We're still 94% saturated. We still have 19 plus volumes percent of oxygen in the blood. Let's come up to 30%. We can see it dropping. Mixed venous PO2 is also dropping dramatically. And if we were to go up to 50%, which would be one completely collapsed lung, although it would not even be 50% because the blood supply to that lung would also be restricted if it were collapsed. But in this case, 50% shunt means this individual is in serious trouble, about 41 with the PO2. This is essentially normal venous PO2 and O2 saturation, whereas in this instance, mixed venous is very, very low, down around 27 millimeters of mercury. So reinitializing again, this is now finding its way back to its normal PO2. And let's go back up to a 10% shunt to give us some significant uh, change and ask the question, what happens with an anemic individual to arterial PO2 and mixed venous PO2 in the presence of a 10% shunt? So I'm going to bring hemoglobin concentration down to 10, and that's grams per 100 milliliters of blood and predict what's going to happen here and here. The mixed venous 
is going to be easy to answer. We are delivering less oxygen to the tissues. The tissues are still consuming the same amount of oxygen. So what ends up in the veins is clearly going to be less. Well, since there's a shunt here, if the venous PO2 goes down, and that venous PO2 then re-enters the blood through this right-to-left shunt, we're going to see a reduction in arterial PO2 as well. So let's check on that, and I will now enter that number. And yes, that is exactly what happened. Mixed venous PO2 fell because supply went down, demand stayed the same. I always like to use supply and demand in these discussions. Supply refers to the amount of oxygen moving toward the tissues. Demand is what the tissues are removing. In this case, supply went down, demand stayed the same. So what's left over for the veins is going to be lower. And that blood will then mix with the pulmonary capillary blood and bring down arterial PO2 as well. Let's now increase the metabolic rate. We're going to increase the demand for oxygen. Double this to 500 milliliters of oxygen per minute being consumed. So demand has risen, has doubled. Supply has not changed. Same hemoglobin, same cardiac output. What's going to happen then to the mixed venous PO2 and arterial PO2? Increasing demand without changing supply means we're going to extract more oxygen and therefore less is going to be available for the veins. That is going to then feed back, re-enter the pulmonary venous blood and bring down arterial PO2. So let's check and see if that is what happens. Exactly. We showed a reduction in mixed venous PO2, which brought down arterial PO2 in the presence of this large shunt fraction. So demand went up, supply was unchanged. I'm going to bring this back to 250, where we were, and let's double the cardiac output. At this point, we're going to double the cardiac output to 10 liters per minute. So supply went up. Demand has not changed. 250 milliliters of oxygen per minute is the same demand, but supply has gone up. So if supply exceeds demand, we should see an increase in the PO2 in the venous blood. And again, that will feed back and re-enter the pulmonary vein. So let's check this one out. And that is exactly what happened. We saw an increase in mixed venous PO2, which then caused an increase in arterial PO2 because of the mixing of venous and, and pulmonary venous blood. So we'll bring cardiac output back to 5. And now let's ask the question, Normally, when the metabolic rate rises, there is a compensation. As PO2 falls, the system is going to try to bring that PO2 back up. So let's increase metabolic rate to 500 again. Now remember, we're at 75 PO2 here. We increase the demand. It drops us down to 65, approximately. If this individual were exercising, then demand has gone up which means the system should increase supply. We do that by increasing cardiac output. So let's double that now to 10 and see if we get back up to where we were. So in this case, we've increased the cardiac output to 10. We're back to 75, exactly where we were. Demand went up by twofold. Supply went up by twofold. Therefore, we're right back to where we were with this 10% shunt. All right, let's go back to 5 liters per minute here and 250 here. And let's see what happens now with acidosis. I'm going to change the pH to 7. And when I enter this number, we'll make a prediction first. Then I'll enter the number. In this individual, normally the venous PO2 is around 40. Arterial PO2 is about 75. What's going to happen if I have this acidotic condition? Well, we might predict that the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve will move to the right. And if it moves to the right, we should see a rise in both venous and arterial PO2. So let's check. Indeed, the curve has moved to the right. right. The red curve represents the original. The blue curve is where we are now. And we can see mixed venous PO2 has risen to 52. Arterial PO2 has risen to 88. A word of caution. There is a rule of thumb going around. Actually, there are several. But this particular rule of thumb involves shunts. And it goes like this. If there is a 20 millimeter of mercury difference between alveolar and arterial PO2, there is no significant shunt fraction. All right, let's see what would happen here if I increase the shunt fraction until arterial PO2 is about 80. If arterial PO2 is 80, it turns out that represents about a 7% shunt. Again, not much to really concern oneself about. 
I presented a case once, and this individual, this woman, had an alveolar PO2 of about 67. Apparently, some damage was done to the central respiratory controller, specifically the CO2 chemoreceptors, and she was not responding to high levels of CO2. She was hypoventilating. So her PCO2 was 60, her PO2 was about 67, and her arterial PO2 was about 54. So let's bring this down to 67. Let's increase the shunt fraction until arterial PO2 is 54. I'm raising the fraction right about here. Right here, that's a 21% shunt. The shunt fraction depends on content, not pressure. The rule of thumb used by many physicians refers to one condition, and that is normal alveolar PO2. If you're at high altitude, or in the case of this individual, there is clearly a significant shunt because of her hypoventilation. Under normal circumstances, small changes in volume represent fairly large changes in pressure, as we can see here with our 10% shunt. Very small change in content, large change in pressure. Another way to look at that is large changes in partial pressure represent small changes in content. And that's because we're at the top here on this flat part of the curve. As we move down around this elbow and start approaching this steep part of the curve, those rules change. So let's go back to the 67 and 21% shunt. So once again now, we're seeing the condition in which we have a fairly large change in content and a much smaller change in pressure. Again, another way to look at this is small changes in pressure can lead to large changes in content. That concludes this talk on shunts.